Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving us some of your valuable time today. My name is George Vergolius. I'm the medical director with R3. I've been with R3 for a little under 10 years now. Um, my background is in forensic psychology, um, and I also am a certified threat manager. So I've uh, developed a specialty working with resilience, identifying threats, managing threats, and promoting uh, resilience and workplace well-being. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about that today as we navigate through. Hart? Thank you, Dr. Vergolius. Thank you, Shane. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Very much looking forward to this conversation and your questions uh, towards the end. So a little bit about my background, uh, 25 years now, roughly in the crisis management space, both uh, across the U.S. and about 50 different countries around the world. And that really spans across a number of different types of events or issues, everything from natural disasters to targeted violence uh, to issues related to uh, IT as well, and, and various types of events in between. Uh, working very closely with a number of uh, insurance-related uh, um, opportunities to manage risk uh, as well, and modeling some of the risk-related issues that we're going to be talking about today. So again, looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you both. So let's get it started here. Um, Hart, can you kind of talk to us quickly about kind of R3 Continuum and some of the expertise that they have? Yeah, this this is, you know, it's it's always a pleasure to talk about this um, and, and certainly introduce some of you that may be new to R3's world. Uh, one, R3 has been in existence now, as you can see, for, for over 30 years, uh, providing services in over 100 countries. You can see an incredibly active portfolio of crisis-related issues that we deal with on a year-to-year -year basis. 18,000 responses are on a typical year for us, and we'll break that down a little bit as we talk about some of the other elements as we go through. And most importantly for us, being psychologically behavioral health uh, based allows us insight into the human psyche, allows us to help organizations to understand how to deal with individuals, both from a shareholder, client, employee uh, perspective, and bringing all of those together to return to some aspect of productivity. And you're gonna hear that time and time again. Let's get back to productivity, even though we've had one of these issues. So being able to provide that both proactive uh, and reactive guidance and support when organizations need it. Excellent, excellent. Um, so let's move on here. And I kind of wanted to talk to uh, to you, George, real quick, just kind of giving the kind of the, the background of the, over the last year and kind of what we've kind of been going through and, and how that's kind of impacted people. Certainly, certainly. So you're seeing a whole bunch of stressors, uh, various types of psychosocial stressors on this slide um, that we've all in some way or another, or I would say most of us, I'd say all of us have been hit by some of these. Some of this have been inf impacted by most, if not all of these. Um, and they were unexpected uh, in large measure. I mean, we go back to December of 19, people were not expecting, uh, unless you worked in infectious disease and were tightly connected to China and the CDC, maybe you saw some early warning signs, but most of us didn't. And so all of these stressors hit people and they hit our society, they hit our workplaces. Um, almost overnight uh, on a time span that really felt that way. And we needed to adapt. And there are a lot of things that required adaptation. And Hart's going to talk a bit about kind of the crisis planning side of that and the logistical side. But there's also the human side of how do people adapt to that over time. And what's interesting is people can adapt to a lot of difficult situations, but adapting to multifactorial stressors all at once that also not only are stressful in themselves, but also pull us away from the natural stress reliefs that we have, like community and family and faith-based groups and sports events and concert venues. All of that had an impact this year that really was unprecedented and certainly unprecedented with anyone that's been alive. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit is how does that impact from a behavioral health angle? How do these types of things impact the workplace, both at the individual and at the organization level? Yeah, and, and kind of backing up to that, um, Dr. Vergoli, is kind of what two parts here. What happens when there is an uncertainty in a traumatic situation, and kind of what does that mean for us? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So what's interesting is I, I have a saying that I, I like to beat 
the drum a lot about, and it's that fear loves a vacuum. When we are afraid, it's the common human response to fill that fear, that vacuum rather, with, with information. Um, and in social media and the ability to get all kinds of information from the web and from social media, we tend to fill it with something. And often we will fill it with the worst case scenario. So what, what often happens when we have am, ambiguous situations or unclear situations, we will speculate and we'll speculate to our worst fears. Now, part of that has a survival mechanism because we're, we're kind of, we're preparing for the worst. That helps bolster our, it helps temper, believe it or not, some of our anxiety. In other cases, it could exacerbate our anxiety, but it bolsters us to get ready for the worst. That's not necessarily a bad thing if it's done in moderation. The difficulty we saw in early 2020 is we were facing, again, for anyone alive, a truly unprecedented event of this large scale worldwide pandemic that we really didn't know. We knew, we knew a lot about coronaviruses, but we didn't know a lot about this particular strain. There was a lot of differing information as the science was coming in and changing rapidly. And on top of the science adapting rapidly, which is legitimate changes in the evidence, we, we, there was a lot of misinformation and a lot of fear was behind that. And so there was a really fearful, anxious environment in the spring going into the summer of, um, of 2020. So disinformation and misinformation, some of it is intentional, others it's not intentional. It's simply a matter of changing the the understanding of the best practices that we know in science and medical treatment over time. It wasn't an intent, but it was a change to a rapidly evolving and developing medical response. All of that created a lot of fear and anxiety. And it also uh, created a lot of distrust, right? Where people, even to this day, there's people that totally are on board with the vaccine. And then there's people that think it's some kind of conspiracy. Um, so you have a wide range of reactions. What's important as leaders, and Hart can speak to this as well, I'm gonna hand it to him in a second, is provide credible information based on the best available evidence at the time. And then present a, a perspective, if you will, where our employees and our stakeholders understand that that information can change, right? It can change over time. There were some times where we believed wearing one mask was sufficient. Then there was some call that you should double mask. Now there's some calls again that single masking is okay. And now there's some talk, the, the early talk of at what point can we start getting away from masking in certain geographic areas or um, uh, areas that have you know a certain degree of vaccinations per capita. These are logistics that Hart could probably speak to better, but all of that is placed in an environment of humans dealing with the anxiety, dealing with the fear, and then trying to plan their lives going forward. So it's really important as leaders that we are aware of what that information is, how we disseminate and communicate that information, and having a bi-directional communication stream so that we're not only sharing information, but we're also hearing the concerns and anxieties of the people that um, essentially we have in our charge that we're overseeing and supervising and managing. Hart, do you wanna add some things from kind of a crisis management logistical perspective? So a few things obviously that we've been through here recently that are going to continue to carry us through. Um, one is when we think about uh, uncertainty as, as we've been talking about here and certainly employees, the employee basis, what we find is, is about 50% of employees as they're going through the process that we're going through now have come out and said specifically they do not feel that they've received adequate information from their employers. Um, that's a tough number when you really start to open that up and aggregate, as we're going to talk about, aggregate some of all of this, uh, some of this information as to what does it mean from an organizational perspective. So I, there is a tremendous vacuum for organizations right now to continue to try and fill. Excellent. Thank you both for that. So moving on then, I, I, I kind of wanted to touch on um, R three continuums disruptive event management and kind of what that means and and how that's been utilized over the last year. George, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so disruptive event management is kind of the next phase of what used to be called critical incident stress debriefing, um, and it's the next phase. I'll explain that in just a, a second. 
when there is a just we like the term disruptive event because the older model anchored this into a traumatic event or a traumatic situation. And the truth is there could be a number of events that are very emotionally and psychologically disruptive that may not be perceived or may not even objectively reach a definition of having been traumatic. Um, and what we know is that disruptive events in the workplace have a significant ripple effect emotionally and psychologically, not only across the direct people that they may impact, but also across, across managers and others that are touched in a similar way. Um, and there may be several, several people removed from the actual event. And so we respond to um, a couple thousand of these events every month. They could be anything from workplace suicides, accidental deaths in the workplace, impacts of natural disasters, certainly human or man-made um, types of actions like violence or domestic violence or robberies and other types of threats. Um, and then the goal of these is to facilitate um, kind of psychological skill building to enhance our natural resilience and allow people to tap into their natural resilience abilities so that they can kind of claim, reclaim their life. And in some cases, people are really set back emotionally and psychologically, and they need to work to reclaim their life. And in some rare cases, it happens, they might need some formal clinical services or clinical counseling. In many cases, it's almost an inoculating effect. It's giving them some um, psychological and emotional skills and support and coaching to help them rebound in a way so that they don't falter and that they could kind of, in fairly short order, process the event, make understanding of the event, and get back to kind of pr productive uh, activity, not only in work, but also in their life. Um, and we do that both at the individual and the group level. Um, the focus could be a number of different directions. We do a lot of this with executive leadership or at the executive C-suite level. A lot of it is focused on risk management. Hart could speak a little more about that. Um, enterprise resilience, business continuity concepts, and then just safety and security concerns. All of these are things in which we can leverage disruptive event management to help solidify a, an adaptive response, both at the individual and the group and even the organizational level. Hart, from your angle, do you wanna add anything to that? Sure, thank you. So I think there's, a, there's an interesting way to reframe what what some of the traditional aspects, whether we refer to them as enterprise risk management, whether we refer to them as crisis management, business continuity, emergency management, all of these elements have uh, well-developed, in many cases, plans, process, procedures, risk analytics that sit behind it, data that sits behind it. All of these become influencers to the overall process. And I think one of the things that we have realized, certainly over the past year, and as and I don't think this is going to be forgotten moving forward necessarily, is to reframe employees as an influencer of your organization. We know from a productivity basis that the productivity of employees has the largest effect on the outcome of the success of the organization itself. So why would we not want to build that in as an influencer, if not the primary influencer, of the overall success of an organization. And we're gonna we'll break this down a little bit more. But the idea behind and in, in the challenge behind doing that is one, we're gonna have to break down silos. So here's a few uh, pieces of information I think that are helpful to start to put this into context. About 46% of those surveyed, employees surveyed lack confidence in their overall crisis management and business continuity plan. Um, and, and you're going to see that play out time and time again, at least for the moment. Certainly over the past year, about 80% 80, 80 of organizations enacted plans. Now, likely the other 20% of organizations didn't have a plan to enact, but 80% of organizations actually said they enacted their plans. 95% at the moment are coming out of the current environment, trying to think ahead a little bit and realizing that they need improvement in those plans. And about 90% of organizations are starting to figure out how to invest to, um, to improve those, those specific plans. And when we talk about those, those plans, there's a few, few pieces. One is their focus on crisis management, according to the surveys, enterprise risk, and business continuity. 
And a lot of what we're seeing over and over and over again is this idea of how do we address and continue to deal with employees becoming self-sufficient at scale. Now, we went through this emergency transition where everyone had to work somewhat remotely, but trying to do that at scale for an elong elongated period of time and build that self-sufficiency uh, is, is quite difficult. And there are a lot of things that certainly go into that. The question moving forward, certainly from this slide as, as we, we continue the conversation here is, is that disruption something that we're just going to get past and, uh, and move on? Or is that disruption actually a catalyst for change as we move forward? Will this event itself start to bring to the forefront the employees as an influencer or driver of the business more so than, than really anything else? Yeah, and to, to kind of build off that, Hart, um, can you kind of talk about the corporate impact of disruptive events? So as you can see from the slide, there are a number of things when you aggregate an individual's experience and you multiply that throughout the organization, you have a number of things that now senior leadership is going to have to address at some level. We're continuing to address it now with, across many different organizations as we're talking about a return to occupancy. So this actual or perceived safety, is there an increase or decrease in safety and how are we going to address the physical aspect of, am I safe to return into an office type of environment that, that I loved dearly prior to all of the things that we've gone through? And so you also find individuals and organizations starting to go out and get various opinions. Now, that can be difficult, as we've talked about, Dr. Vergoli has talked about, you know, fear loving a, a vacuum, depending on where individuals go to get that information, has an impact as, as to what they're likely to do. So managing that, again, at, at scale. You can see some of the other things that, and we're, we'll touch on this, but understanding the needs of the employee population as they go through one of these events also becomes quite important as to the, the potential outcomes. I think the next bullet point there, as you see on that, that first line, but harsh judgments, if, if the things that are being addressed are not handled uh, correctly, that may be in a legal setting, it may be in a number of different settings from a reputational perspective, but you'll see that, that backlash if uh, senior leadership and others are not addressing these these issues appropriately at the right time. Now, a couple of things that, that have come out of, again, the past year or so that we've seen. First, from a senior leadership perspective, the challenges in communicating without being in a co-located environment have actually increased the requirements on senior leadership by roughly eight hours a week. Now, many of our senior leaders that have that, that continue to uh, to do quite well in this environment have never had to manage remotely at scale uh, before. So this was an entirely new potential environment, and that required a bit of support in many cases to understand that that transition. The other is that employees, without now in many cases taking lunch break, there's no commute. Uh, one side or the other, or just different breaks throughout the day, are generally working about four hours more a week than they were before. These are starting to compound, the, compound each other on top of all of the things that you're seeing here on the screen, challenging the productivity. So we're working more hours. Are we more productive or not? And that's going to be a continuing question for organizations. And they're all going to answer that somewhat differently. About 60% of, of employees have reported going through this process that you see on the screen saying that they know what to do. Again, about 40% really had no idea how to refocus um, and become that, that uh, completely self-sufficient um, employee base from a remote perspective. The last one I think, uh, the last point I'll make certainly on, on this slide I think is, is interesting because of all of the pressures you see on the screen, because of the need for productivity to continue in the workplace, we've seen, and many of you on the, on the call today as well, but you've seen this shift to wellness and discussing wellness. Now, the, how we define wellness, it could be quite different from each other, but the idea of, of now realizing employees in many cases didn't know how 
uh, to make this emergency transition. About 50% were not happy with the organization on how they communicated because in many, in many cases, the, community, the organization didn't know what to say or how to say it. But now what we're seeing is organizations are recognizing the hardships that individual employees have had to go through, as you can see on the screen here, based on those hardships, now trying to fill in some of those gaps. And we're starting to build uh, more and more ideas around wellness, around the employee base, knowing that roughly 50% don't feel well communicated, 60%, only about 60% really were comfortable in the transition itself. So again, is this a catalyst for change or is this a, a momentary uh, disruption that we're gonna get past? It is certainly something to, to continue to watch. All right, and well, uh, I, I actually, I wanna ask you on this next slide too, but I'll give you a moment to catch your breath here. Um, just a reminder to everybody that if you have any questions um, for Dr. Vergolius or Hart, we should have some time at the end to answer those questions. So feel free to enter those in the Q&A widget and we will, um, hopefully get those answered for you at the end. Um, so Hart, I, I kind of wanted to reach back to you again, and, and we talked about some of the impact, but what are some of the other um, challenges that could be uh, coming up the pipe? So starting from a, a, a business perspective, a senior leadership perspective, what we find time and time again, when organizations go into some level of crisis, disruptive event in some form or fashion, most leaders will uh, fall back on their own experience. This natural decision-making process, naturaliz naturalistic decision-making process, rather than some sort of structure that is applied to this. And so for those leaders that have been through a crisis, that have been through something quite similar, that reverting back to naturalist naturalistic decision-making may actually work and provide some benefit to the organization. In most cases, Unfortunately, it does not. And I'm gonna give you some statistics here in just a minute to sort of highlight that. And the need for some level of a structured based process to make some of these decisions, simply because this is uncharted territory for many people uh, and important to get the right resources uh, at the right time uh, for that. The second component that we've seen is this adverse impact of the Pareto pr of outcomes, Pareto outcomes, Pareto principle. And what we've seen over the years from a business perspective, and this relates directly to business interruption, business continuity, is this idea, this drive to efficiency, this drive to no slack um, over and over and over again, whether it's in the supply chain, whether it is in day-to-day uh, -day operations. And that drive, which does relate to shareholder value, now all of a sudden starts to break down. Um, and we need to have a more complex system that's more adaptable uh, for organizations to continue to be productive, even in the face of some of these challenges. I think the interesting question that, that still we're waiting to see how it's going to get answered in building Slack into our own operating systems, in building these sort of uh, building towards more of an adaptive outcome versus an efficiency only based outcome, do we continue to, to deliver on shareholder uh, demands shareholder value, will they value that versus going back to core efficiency, no slack type of operations? But we have seen that that that, in, that environment has not been fully, um, uh, fully successful given the types of disruptions we've seen over the past year. The, the next one there, which I think is quite interesting, when we look at from a senior leadership and a business perspective, Again, roughly 37% of corporate directors have confidence in their business continuity or crisis plans. It's a relatively low number, again, leading into why are these plans, process, procedures may not, why are they not as effective as we, we thought they were? Businesses overall, when we break down the business environment over the past year, 70% of businesses have said uh, this past year has, has resulted in a negative impact. You might say that's somewhat uh, expected. About 6% come out about neutral um, over that period of time. About 14% say that this event has created a positive impact. Now, not only do we see that sort of wide variation of, of organizations, but we also see when we look at returns within that 14% that said positive and the 70% that said negative, there can be as much as a five times 
difference between the, 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 the positivity and the loss of the organization uh, within, those, within the, the distribution itself. So not only do we see a distribution of companies, we see a pretty wide distribution of results uh, going into a crisis type of event. Much of that result is related, some of it's related to the crisis itself. Um, some of it is related to very small decisions that have to be made by leadership. And those small decisions have massive outcomes when you go into a crisis type of event. And so again, understanding the human element that goes into those, those critical decisions in order to create the outcomes you want, we all want to be in that 14% every time there is a, a crisis, and we all benefit by managing that, that correctly. All right. And so this next one here, I, I want to I want to speak to both of you, but I want to start with Dr. Vergolius. Um, can you kind of talk about productivity and kind of what's been going on just in general for employees and, and what's been impacting? Yeah, certainly. And there's a few things that tie into what Hart was just saying as well. What I want to start with is uh, I'm hi highlighting a study that came out just this past January by Deloitte. Um, they surveyed, I, I believe, a couple hundred CEOs in the U.S., um, large scale survey asked a lot about their culture, what they were working on, their leadership initiatives, um, and their employees. And there's a few things they found that were kind of of interest. One is, um, and this is a good finding, 98% of them had mental health and well being as a top priority in 2021, focusing on that for their employees. But what was interesting is when they looked at the employees, 55% of employees across all those companies said they experienced an increase in mental health symptoms in 2020, a third in, in, um, experienced an increase in substance abuse issues, and 10% reported a decrease to, this is to Hart's point, 10% reported a decrease in productivity on average of 10 hours per week. So that means 10% of those workforces, and this was a nice random sample of different industries, different um, net worth and so on, 10% of them, 10% uh, of those employees basically said that they were losing over one day a week to, um, to their general, um, um, I'm sorry, half a day a week to, to just lack of productivity um, out of the gate in 2020. These are significant impacts. The other thing that's interesting, Hart just talked about uncertainty from kind of a business and economic angle. On the human side, what we see with uncertainty and this has been demonstrated for decades now, is humans tend to, I mentioned earlier, they tend to get fearful, but they also tend to contract and regress in their behavior. They tend to pull in and fall back on what they know, on habits that they know, response styles that they know have worked. Um, they tend to get more extremely conservative, and I don't mean politically, I, I mean in terms of their thought processes, sharing with others, taking chances. And so what, what, what slowly dies on the vine at these times, if this is prolonged, are things like innovation, risk-taking, creativity. And that eventually eats away at a business. Um, and that can be very, very um, troubling over time for a business that not only needs to keep its edge in a natural economic environment, but needs to keep its edge in the midst of the economic downturn and challenges that the pandemic brought on, where many businesses needed to pivot and become more creative. And how do we survive? How do we keep an edge? Um, how do we stay on top of the competition? How do we ensure that the talent we have isn't gonna jump ship and go somewhere else? So all of these are a mix of all the things that Hart is talking about, as well as the human factors that contribute to it. Um, in addition to all of that, what we see is we see other, other, other behavioral indicators of, of that's those psychosocial stressors that are hitting. One is we're seeing an uptick in interpersonal violence. And this isn't just large scale attacks. We've certainly seen um, a, a massive increase, you might say statistically, in the last few weeks um, that have been covered on the national scale, but loss of talent, right? Um, I, I am often beating the drum that leaders right now, if they're not investing in their employees, um, or if they are, they have a fundamental choice. They are either going to kind of be a light, a light, a beacon to their employees navigating through the pandemic in a way 
that they're going to lock in trust and loyalty and commitment for years to come, or they're going to wantonly waste that kind of human equity and their top talent is going to leave and go find somewhere else where they feel heard and understood, they feel taken care of, they feel valued, um, or they just feel like leadership has their thumb on the pulse of what's going on. Um, so loss of key employees and personnel, um, loss of other staff in general, whether they are top tier performers or not, we're seeing that. We're also seeing generational factors. What we know is Gen X, Gen Z, they tend to move around more. They tend to be comfortable as opposed to my generation. Um, um, they tend to be comfortable saying, you know, I'm not getting along at this place for a month, so I'm gonna leave. I, I need to have that feeling for a year, you know, when I look back at my career before I start moving on. So you have a, a larger turnover that's already predisposed in the labor market, and now these added psychosocial stressors exacerbate that risk, and it becomes more challenging for leaders. Um, part of the difficulty, and, and Hart's gonna speak more to this, I'm gonna pass it to him in a second, is you have different industries, you have different work sectors that also have different pressures around do they have to work or do they not have to work, right? During the pandemic, people that worked at grocery stores had to go in, right? The police, fire, fire personnel, EMS, medical personnel, certainly they had to do their job. They had to go in and do their job. I fortunately could do my job for the most part from my home office. So there's have to works. There's other issues around people that can't work or people that have difficulty working. And then there's the factor of people that just don't wanna work. They don't feel comfortable. Uh, Hart and I have been in a number of situations where we've consulted with companies where the company seems to be doing everything right in terms of safety and even security, but just because they're safe doesn't mean that people feel secure. There's that human element where you're doing everything right. I might even acknowledge you're doing everything right. I still don't feel safe uh, going into work because I don't feel the virus is under control or I don't think their vaccination um, um, numbers are high enough in my area to go back into work. So as a result of that, you get factors like presenteeism, ghost employment, and so on. So I'm trying to get that from kind of the human behavioral side. Hart, do you want to add anything to this from kind of the, the risk management and large scale organization? organization? I'll just add one one thing. And, and you, when you look at the the history of the planning process from a crisis management, business continuity, uh, enterprise risk, planning models that, that exist, a lot of the staffing related aspect of those models are, are they present? Do I have individuals that can work and do our employees present or are they not present? And it becomes a bit of a logistics exercise to say, well, if I have this number of people present, that must mean my productivity is going to be this. Or if I can get a few more people, my productivity is going to be higher. And so it is this uh, algorithm based approach that when we really break this down, as you can see, each of those potential communities, those that have to go in, those that can't go in, those that don't want to go in, those that may be in but are really not working because they're concerned about all of the other aspects of their life and their family and everything else that's going on. All of those different types of situations now, all those different populations have to be potentially addressed. They're all experiencing something slightly different and may need a slightly different solution set to get productivity back to where you want them to be and allow people to be comfortable, as comfortable as they can be in a crisis environment in the setting that, that we're asking them to work in. Yeah. Hart, that's a, that's a great point. If I could piggyback off that just real quickly. So what's interesting to what Hart was saying is I've been working with R3 for, I said, on just under 10 years, and I've been working predominantly from home. Pre-COVID, I did a lot of travel, but my home office is in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our corporate offices are in Minneapolis and Grand Rapids. So this was my, my office. You're looking at it. And I had the homework thing down. I, I had it nailed. The pandemic hit, and I suddenly became a school teacher and a first aid administrator and a hostility child you know, management interventionist. Um, and all these other roles I had to step into because my wife works at a hotel and she had to go into the hotel. Ironically, I don't know if you noticed a few minutes ago, my son popped his head in in the middle of the presentation, right? These are the new realities of work from home. And I found myself struggling early summer, late spring, early summer last year, not getting stuff done. 
and I am like a type A driven guy and I had this nailed for eight some years. And then I realized there's all these minute decisions and intervent, uh, in, um, inter interruptions that I now have to contend with. Um, and things as small as there's a new, there's a new friend down the road, uh, my son's 10. There's a new boy down the road, and my son wanted to go hang out with him yesterday. I'm in the middle of a business call. And he asked, can I go see so-and-so? And I had to think for a minute because my first thought was, well, have they been vaccinated? Have they traveled recently? What's their approach to COVID? Are they taking it seriously or not? Do I allow them to ride bikes, or can, I, can he go in his house? We haven't met these people yet. These are questions that weren't on the table a year and a half ago. And it, these things erode productivity. They erode the ability for sustained focus. So I just want to re reiterate and highlight to Hart's point how much that can impact and how much leaders need to start thinking of ways to navigate around that and, and give people the supports they need to navigate through and regain the productivity that we had. So thank you for that interruption. <laughs> Oh, no, that was great. It's, 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 I mean, people are, are just, there's so much more to think about nowadays. And I think that was an excellent, excellent example too. Um, so uh, going deeper into kind of the violence aspect of everything, um, there's been a lot going on, you know, the, over the last year or so. And I, uh, Hart, kind of, this is a very general question, but why do you think that we're seeing more violence? Yes, it's a great question, and, and this is going to be studied for, for many, many years to come. What we've seen in the early studies that we've conducted um, in trying to understand what the human component is over the past year, what, are, what and how do people deal with the long-duration crisis event, non-geographic in nature? It's not a hurricane that, that just hits one state and moves on. This is something that impacted us and the whole world all at the same time for an elongated period of time, something that, that none of us really have had any experience in. What you find is that the, the ability to manage ongoing and compounding stressors during that time frame and rotating stressors because it wasn't just one we would we would like to see just one and we can manage that and then work our way down but it was a rotating number of stressors for that period of time has put people uh, generally on edge and what you find from an economic standpoint then once they're already on edge now we add financial and economic stress we add housing insecurity stress we add food insecurity stress we know from a statistical basis that housing insecurity has a relationship to domestic violence and, and potentially even drug use. We, we see food insecurity has a direct relationship to uh, increases in crime. We see these things playing out, but we normally don't see them all playing out at the exact same time. And that's what we've experienced over the past year. And so now individuals that are, are at that breaking point don't have as many alternatives to deal with, with any more stress and we see, unfortunately, more and more violence, and that's not likely to to be reduced anytime soon. So then, kind of going off that, Dr. Vergolius, what happens within an organization when you know with with this increase in violence that's that's been going on? Yeah. So what's interesting, and in heart, those are great; those are excellent points. And I mean, you said it better than you know, as good as I can, and better. Um, what we're seeing is when you look in the aggregate. Mass events still haven't markedly increased from year over year, um, but the individual hostility has. And we've also seen that as an expression of large scale demonstrations. And we could say those are mass events because there's a ton of people, but I'm, I'm making a distinction between individuals as part of a mass demonstration and the, and the mass attacker. Now, in the last two weeks, we have seen a, a, a significant uptick, uptick in just the last few weeks of a number of mass attack or mass shooter situations, certainly. But in general, it's that general hostility. It's that general sentiment of I am, I have a shorter fuse, I'm more irritable and angry, and I'm more likely to kind of blow my top, certainly verbally and maybe even spilling over into physically. Um, and Hart nailed it when he talked about the long-term impact of all of these stressors. I mean, given enough stressors, and enough impact over time, every one of us is capable of losing our physical control in some way. I'm not saying we would go on a mass shooting. That's a bit extreme, and there's a number of variables that contribute to that trajectory. But the ability to think we would never throw something at somebody or punch somebody, we all have a breaking point. 
And what Hart is getting at is there's a number of compounding stressors that have contributed to that. What's also interesting I want to highlight is Hart talked about all everything that's been added, those stressors, those added um, difficulties, economic, financial, social, and so on, the worries about the virus. But something also last year was taken away, and that is all of our kind of natural supports. And what I call the little emotional strokes that we get by going to our kids' Little League games, going to church or our faith-based groups, going to the local brewery for poker night or trivia night, if we did that once, twice a month or whatever we did, right? Um, fishing with a group of people that now we're staying away from. Seeing loved ones, like my in-laws, that we didn't see for almost a year out of safety and concern. Those little things, just going to the grocery store and in a way stopping and having an intimate, not intimate, but a close conversation with somebody, all of those things went away. So not only was a lot of bad stuff added to the stress pile, we also had a lot of resources taken away at the same time that kind of restricted our ability for outlets, the ability to allow other people to help just give us that little calm down edge that we need just to release our tension. Um, combined, that's, that's really troubling. So on the corporate level, it's just really important for people, for corporations to not only be aware, um, well, I'm gonna say it that way, to be aware of where are your people in terms of how they're dealing with this emotionally and where are they on edge in terms of that frustration and that hostility? Are there venues by which they can share those concerns? Do you have anonymous reporting? I mean, we're started, I'm starting to tiptoe into talking about kind of threat management and workplace violence protocols, and I don't wanna to go too far down that road, but are there avenues by which people can express frustration and have outlets? Are there organic internal support groups? Are there open door policies with managers, even if it's a virtual open door, to reach out and talk through some of these things? Um, those are the things that will allow people to either, um, in a cathartic way, let the steam out, or in some cases, when it's a more sinister planned trajectory that somebody might be on, such as a mass shooting, it allows the there's some evidence that those people are more likely to share with a coworker. It's what we call leakage in the field, where they share with a coworker or some uh, another person in the organization their intent, which then can allow that person to bring that forward, and it allows companies to be able to catch those upstream and do something about that. A lot of the violence threats that Hart and I work on every year are a result of somebody that's thinking of doing something bad who tells somebody and that third person that's told then brings it forward to some authorities or HR or management. So there's a number of ways to kind of think through that, but being aware that everyone has that higher level of stress compounded by the stressors that Hart talked about, I think is the first step to be, to be mindful of. Wow. You, you both made excellent points and that that's, it's a very important thing to, to think about and to take notes on and kind of understand that, that, Things are changing and, and there's different ways to, to go about it. Um, in an earlier slide, we, we also mentioned loss of staff. And I, I want to talk to you guys both about this because um, I think there's both both good perspectives on it. Um, Hart, can you kind of talk about some of the, the reasons and what's going on with loss of staff right now? Well, I'm, not, I'm just going to take it from the perspective of risk, right? So when we're talking about plans, policies, procedures, how we're going to move forward, violence uh, certainly is going to play a role, and the concern related to workplace violence will continue to play a role, unfortunately, um, until we see an, an overall decrease in stressors and an overall increase in that, those adaptive behaviors that are that are beneficial for us and how we deal with that stress. I think that the other issue for many of those that are involved in risk planning and, and business continuity are what are those elements that would cause a potential loss of staff? They, they simply are not able to, to work for a period of time. And what we've seen certainly this year, we've, you know, natural disasters and climate change, we've seen the tearing of the polar vortex, which has caused problems throughout the country, specifically in Texas, which are still being uh, worked out. We're starting to see an, an, uh, a La Nina event, which is going to create some issues related to, we're already seeing it now with with storms in, in one part of the Dixie Alley and others, we're seeing, now seeing increases in potential hurricanes. So a lot of things starting to play out 
from a risk planning perspective that we need to start paying more attention to with staff not being able to, to work. Terrorism being another one, we're seeing certain uh, pre or sort of early indicators in a few parts of the world that we're starting to see a bit of a resurgence by various terrorism groups that we haven't really had to experience over the past five years or so. You can see some of the others, employee activism and, and some of the challenges with that. But we are seeing the need uh, to elongate some of our crisis plans to deal with the loss of employees. They just can't come to work for, for a period of time, and that's going to continue to be a challenge. Uh, Dr. Vergolis, do you have any, any extra comments on this? Uh, uh, not really beyond that each of those things that Hart is talking about adds yet another stressor. I mean, what we know is being out of work for whatever reason, for whatever reason, um, whether it's a really legitimate illness or it's somebody who their doctor thinks they can work, but they don't think they can work or whatever the reason may be, um, or it's just a layoff, which we've seen as well, is, an, is one of the most stressful events that somebody goes through. So that's an added stressor on top of all these other things that Hart is mentioning. Excellent. And I know we've got about 13 minutes left and we do have a, a couple questions here. Um, so we'll, we'll keep on, keep on going here. Um, and again, I want to talk to, to both you on this, but I'll have Hart start um, and kind of walk us through a uh, special case and, and have to work cases. Yeah, great, great questions. And we're seeing it play out in the news in a couple of different ways. So certainly, as we've talked about during this past year, those individuals that, that are on the front lines, whether you talk about hospitals, utilities, responders, airlines, those individuals that really have to be there in order to have a system that's that's functional. And, and that brings its own stressors when everybody else is remote and those individuals have to be on site uh, being able to find and figure out again, talking about how do we support those individuals when we break them down, which part of our organizations are in which subcategory here, can we provide those services that are necessary to get them to productivity, even though they're nervous, they don't want to be there, um, no one else has to go to work at this point in time, and we're starting to see that that impact others. We see IT teams doing the same kinds of things. We see um, investigative groups from an IT perspective uh, that are working 24-7 uh, when there's an event that occurs and they're experiencing things that, you know, they haven't had to experience before. So there's a lot of things that are going on certainly now when we subdivide our, our, pop, our workplace populations and finding ways to support those, uh, not just that are remote and are isolated and are, you know, no, don't feel that they're being communicated with, but there's unique stressors on those individuals that have to go to work as well, certainly over an elongated period of time. And Dr. Vergolius, have you seen, you know, you, Hart mentioned the stressors and everything like that, and we've been talking about that for a bit now, um, but have you seen, you know, how, how much is that really impacting the, the workforce in places that have to continuously go in? Yeah, it's a huge impact. Um, and there's even evidence that in some cases it's causing certain types of vicarious kind of almost a trauma, vicarious trauma reaction. What's, what's so tragic about this finding and that Hart's mentioning and we're talking about is in some ways these can really be easily remedied because it isn't about people wanting the big solution. They just want to feel like leadership is taking care of them. I'm going to give you a real quick example. My wife works at a, at a hotel. When the pandemic hit, they uh, serve, they, 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 they're right near the airport here, RDU Airport near Raleigh. So they serve a couple of crews, right, from big airlines. They had to work. They had to go in. The hotel didn't shut down. At one point, after like two weeks in, three weeks in, the hotel ran out of gloves. Something small, gloves, right? And I understand there was a huge supply chain issue. Everyone knew that. That wasn't the problem. When management was told, they just kind of said, well, you know, we'll get around to it. That was the wrong message. You know, gloves are not that hard. I mean, they were fairly easy to come by at some point, but what people wanted to feel was you are taking gloves seriously. And although gloves may seem like a minor thing, it's really important to the people that are working the front lines. In other words, a number of the staff asked for a protective shield to be put up in front of the front desk. And initially, the existing management back then resisted that 
because they didn't want to be too um, too distant from the from the consumer, from the hotel guest. These are small things that leadership can get right or get wrong and really exacerbate the negative feeling of, of the worker in these scenarios. So it doesn't always have to be the huge, big fix. That's all I want to highlight. Sometimes it can be the small gestures that really make a big difference. Excellent. Excellent point. Yeah. And again, real world story right there. And that's, that's great. It brings, it brings more, uh, just more to it. Um, so kind of a loaded uh, question here or loaded slide, I should say. Um, and I kind of want to get both of your perspectives on it, but we'll start with heart again. Um, kind of just going over uh, predictive volatility a- a- over the next three years. Yeah. I think from a, from a planning po- and, and policy procedure, when we start thinking about how this is going to continue to evolve over time and, and it is evolving, um, the industry itself is, is continuing to evolve is can you get enough, in, uh, you know, sort of integrative thinkers, those individuals that can put um, all of this into perspective and try and make some sense out of it? Do you have enough of those individuals to start being able to predict potential volatility? And I think that's one of the will be one of the key things that, that brings us forward. So the way certainly looking at this right now, the, the next two months, we are still in the same situation we're in now. Various COVID numbers are going to continue to increase. The stressors are still there. Nothing really is changing at the moment on an aggregated basis. After about two months, we should start to see, certainly in the U.S., a reducing risk related environment um, that things will begin to change and hopefully improve. Now, there's some things that are embedded in that six month period of time. You know, we can we start to, to think through vaccinations and likely vaccinations are going to slow down, not because of supply, but simply because of demand. Those that that want it are, are getting it and those that don't want it are not getting it. And so there's, there's some things within that volatility, uh, volatility framework in the next six months that are going to continue to be important. Then when we go through 2022, what does that potentially look like? The rest of the world begins to reduce their their risk as well. Travel is likely, and certainly international travel, is likely to continue to improve during that time frame. But we are certainly in this, uh, in some version of this environment, this volatile environment, for the next three years on a global basis. There's just no way we can get enough people vaccinated in that period of time to bring us out of of the types of situations that we're dealing with now. It will improve individually. It will improve in small groups. It will improve country by country. But from a world perspective, we're still in the middle of this probably for the next three years. And Dr. Vergolius, kind of what what do you think about from a behavioral health standpoint? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be quick because I want to be able to get to the questions and give us time to do that. Um, I, I'm gonna just say don't underestimate human resilience. There's a real quick interesting point here. Many of us recently saw the CDC came out and surprisingly said that suicide rates were down in 2020 compared to previous years. What's also interesting is we know depression was up three times last year, anxiety was up fourfold, substance abuse was up. And we also know there's some indications from other studies that suicidal thinking, thinking ideation was up, but actual suicide rates were down. What's interesting is what we underestimated is when the pandemic hit with everything else that kind of went bad or went south, one thing it forced us to do is go inward. We took more walks in the neighborhood. I know I had a lot more fire pits. I sat around a lot more with my neighbors and just talked. Sports weren't having me running around. Travel wasn't having me run around. I had more time just to chill. And doing that, now there were stressors there to be sure, but in doing that, I also was a little more introspective, but I also reached out more to people. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, Hart, I noticed on the call the other day, you look tired, you doing okay, man? It, all of that forced me to do that more. And by doing that, what I believe is that we actually we, we actually inoculated ourselves a little bit more from hopelessness. And hopelessness is where the suicidal action really comes from. Yes, depression and anxiety are all linked without a doubt. But when you add that hopelessness is when people go to that next step of now I want to take action. So this was a surprise me, to me. It was it was an interesting finding from the CDC. And there's other data that I'm hypothesizing 
meant we also started reaching out more to our fellow person, to our fellow human being this year in a way that maybe in 2019 and 18 and 17 we didn't in, in the manic nature of our lives. So don't underestimate resilience. Don't underestimate our capacity to do tough things. Great points. Um, Hart, just uh, just want to talk to you briefly kind of on ensuring continuity. Can you kind of go over this slide for us here? Yeah, I'll try and encapsulate it with, with really one concept. And that really is, as we talked about before, from a leadership perspective and ensuring continuity for an organization, we talked about the idea of having this structured decision-making models and how important that is. The reason that that's important is you need to make sure that you're taking everything into account before you make your final decisions. However, from a leadership perspective, crisis doesn't necessarily lend itself to an algorithm-based decision model. You need to bring not only all of this information in, but then you've got to bring the human component, what's going on with our employee-based influencers and so forth, and be able to make the best decision, not just for efficiency, but for adaptability and productivity for the organization. And that is just not a simple algorithm um, that all of us are ready to, to put forward. It does create thought. It does create a challenge for leaders. And that's why we see roughly only about 14% that really do well uh, during these times. We want to increase that number as much as possible. All right. And then the the last one here, the last slide before we get to uh, some of the questions, I want to start with um, with you, George, or Dr. Vergolis, and, and kind of talk about the, the takeaways we have from this from on an individual uh, perspective. Sure. Uh, and I'll be I'll be brief on these. So first, first kind of maxim, if you will, is that human behavior is complex. Right. And to understand complex behavior, and our response to the pandemic as individuals and even collectively is a complex phenomenon. We have to understand it from a multifactorial perspective. And now this is challenging for leaders, certainly, but we have to do our best to understand the way it's impacted by different people at different times, by a range of different factors that are pertinent to your corporate culture and your organizational culture. Second is that people don't snap in terms of their anger, their violence, or in their stress reactions. Usually this is something that builds over time, much like a volcano doesn't suddenly blow up. We know that when a volcano erupts, it's been forces going on underneath that have been developing. Whether we notice them or not is a different question, but we know they've been there. If we apply that to our, uh, our employees and the groups we work with, we will kind of have a better metaphor for what we're looking for and what kind of resources we can offer. And lastly, and I already said this, but resilience is ubiquitous. It's the normative response to challenge in the human being. Many of us, I'd say most of us, um, we bounce back from challenging times. Some sooner than others, some of us need more support than others, but being resilient is what is the cornerstone of our evolutionary strength. Um, and we need to tap into that as individuals and as organizational leaders. And I'll leave you with that. All right. And then lastly, Hart, kind of from a corporate side of things, you, you want to uh, go through the takeaways for us? Yeah, as we've been talking about, so that idea of employees being the cornerstone of productivity lends itself to more of a people centric transformation as we think about continuity, um, certainly going forward. The other is in crisis economics from a decision making perspective using the aspects of behavioral science and other elements that are available to us, understanding what are the behaviors that are going to change, both from a shareholder perspective, a client perspective, a leadership perspective, and an employee perspective, to understand what are the new economic dynamics uh, for this environment and how do we, we maximize our ability to take advantage of that. And the last one is continuity expectations, that idea of efficiency down to the nth degree versus adaptability uh, and being able to maintain operations over a period of time, regardless of what happens, that push and pull will likely result in more and more organizations trying to become more adaptable and creating a little bit of slack in the system at the expense of some uh, efficiency. It will likely occur in the near term. All right. Thank you for wrapping that up real quick. Um, so as long as it's okay with you guys, if we take one or two extra minutes here, I, I just want to get to um, one quick question at the end. And I also want to invite everybody in the audience to our next webinar. Um, it'll be on Tuesday, May 18th at 1155 a.m. Uh, Central Time. Our uh, subject matter expert for that one will be Dr. George Vergolius and the title.
shows how proactively supporting employee mental health can have a positive effect on organizational efficacy. Um, this will be a CE webinar that will be discussing how workplaces uh, can promote mental health and support people with mental health challenges, both traditionally and proactively, that are more likely to, and are more likely to reduce absenteeism, increase productivity, and benefit from associated economic gains. Gains. So uh, you can register today using one of the widgets down at the bottom or uh, clicking on the, the uh, call to action right on the council right there. And we hope to see you there for that webinar. Um, we have about one, we're already at the top of the hour, it's 101, but one quick question. And I, I thought this was a very interesting one when it came in. Um, Hart, what has been the change in the number of violent events over the past five years? So it really depends on what violent events you're talking about. Um, what we've seen the past five years from, let's say, explosives use has generally reduced over the past five years. We've seen an uptick over the past roughly six months or so. We've seen terrorism overall reduce on an aggregated basis around the world over the past five years. We're starting to see not just chatter behind the scenes, not just radicalization behind the scenes, but actions being taken in certain parts of the world that are that are relatively high tech. We've seen a lot, a lot of drone events um, in the past few weeks. So those indicators are leading us into a situation that said maybe we have some additional volatility related to terrorism. When we think through things like crime, depending on the city, we've seen over the past year crime increasing uh, fairly significantly related to things like homicide and others. Now, most of that is recurring in the in the home environment in a residential space because we're all working from home. The challenge is that is relatively elevated uh, and certainly high from the last few years. Um, will those types of events find themselves into the workplace as we continue to increase occupancy? And unfortunately, the early answer to that right now, if you take the last two weeks as your sample, the answer to that would unfortunately be Yes, we are likely to see, unfortunately, the migration of some of these violent events into the workplace, and that will continue to be a challenge. All right. Thank you very much.